Hester. Your name is Olga Nguyen. Do I pronounce Nguyen, it well? Nguyen. Nguyen. Um, Vietnamese surname. My dad's got Vietnamese surname. It's the most widespread Vietnamese surname. I don't know. What's the most uh, widespread uh, surname in Netherlands? Johnson. <laughs> yeah, so that would be the equivalent. <laughs> But this is already important because your surname tells a lot about where you come from. And um, me and Eva Maria, we indicated this international intensive training and we asked some trainers and we asked you, wanted to have a team that also represents thinking in inclusion and diversity. So we chose you because you have this background which is not easily to ex easy to explain so i would like you to explain a little bit more that's one part of the story that is your own experience in living in 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 different cultures and the other one is that you work with creativity a lot and that you combine it with nvc which i personally love a lot because i am an artist also Oh, beautiful. It's nice to have that connection with you, Hester. Uh, yeah. um, for me, it's the beauty of NVC. We can connect across the differences and find new and better and exciting and delightful and fun ways to be. How I would like to contribute and like my background, you asked me before that, you know, like to expand a little bit on that. Uh, my favorite way to reply to that is like, how much time do you have? <laughs> I know we don't have that much time, so I'll be brief. Uh, I suppose when I was growing up, there was no word for it. Uh, now, in English speaking, like literature, you'd call it like cross cultural upbringing or even like third culture, when, like, um, in a way, you combine different cultures, different languages, you relate to different places. And uh, I see more and more folks like that um, in the younger generation. <laughs> Well, I was growing up, it was probably like, um, actually, I was growing up in a very diverse area. And if you look at the history uh, way back, uh, sometimes uh, to start with, uh, it belonged to, the land belonged to Circassian people, and then there was genocide of Circassians. Then it was settled by uh, people who were seeking freedom and independence. And actually they had like their own uh, decision-making circles that were democratic, which was very unusual for that part of the world around 1600, you know? Um, yeah, and they were called Cossacks. Uh, and uh, a lot of them, my ancestors were Ukrainian speaking. And so at, at some point it was like no man's land, uh, no person's land, you know? And uh, then depending who would look at it who would say it like some people would say it was ukrainian territory some people would say it was russian territory and at some point it was a free independent republic uh it was about 1920s but then soviet union um got it under its umbrella like with many other places so from that point of view you can say you know it's like depending on the definition <laughs> It's really hard to define uh, who my ancestors were. I'd have to ask them, you know, <laughs> how did you identify yourselves? But yeah, I speak uh, Russian language. Um, I speak Ukrainian language, although my Ukrainian, uh, I'm a heritage speaker, so to speak. Uh, so I grew up hearing it, but it wasn't my language of schooling. And uh, uh, it was only few people who would communicate in it day to day. And then um, I learned English from an early age and I lived all my adult life on and off um, here in West Yorkshire in the UK, <laughs> just like it's the north and that was settled by Vikings. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's a very particular part of the UK. And um, then I also spent about five or six years in Southeast Asia and I've been really, really influenced by it. That's we experienced both community and nonviolent communication in a very different way. And to refer back to what you're saying, um, uh, both Malaysian uh, community that I still think I'm a part of and Vietnamese community, they're both, so to speak, uh, communitarian culture. And of course, it's like statistical and average and people are individual everywhere. And across the board, it means that um, 
people are more aware and from early age uh, people are uh, conditioned to look out for other people like yeah. if i do this what will happen for that person you know so in a way it's almost our interdependence <laughs> that we so value and nvc is emphasized so i've experienced it in a very different way and we see being lived uh, here in the UK, which is like, again, if you look at scientific classifications, a lot of them would call the UK individualistic culture. So we emphasize values like uh, autonomy, independence, freedom, personal individual values, you know. And again, like it's been a very interesting experience to see, you know, like because uh, the needs for the community are still there. We're all communal beings. So it's like, how do we seek for community and interdependence in different cultures? And is yeah. that something uh, that you also want to add to the IIT, this, this vision of, yeah, I'd how it's dependent? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When we structure the training, we try and cater for different needs of people. Like, for example, if you're catering for guests, you might ask people like, or do you have like uh, gluten sensitivities or are you vegetarian or do you not eat carbs or is there anything else I should know about, um, you know, because we, we want to make people comfortable if we're yes. catering for them. And of course, there'd be very different strategies to do it because sometimes we're just like, oh, everyone bring your own food and we'll share. <laughs> You know, um, and so in a way, uh, for me, in some environments, it was like finding myself at the table and there was nothing I could eat and no one would ask. And I'd be like, mm, self-empathy goes a long way, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, communication and saying what I need and then like, oh, actually, like, can we have dialogue? Is it something that's possible for you to provide? Um, so for me, from that experiences, as you said, you know, like, uh, from my unpleasant experiences, I've developed a sharp eye for like, oh, has everyone got something to eat? <laughs> Is everyone comfortable? Because we don't want people starving if we're catering for them. <laughs> you know, so from that point of view, for me, it's um, really important to work as a part of a team to structure such an environment that we can include as many people with as many diverse needs. Um, as we have resources and skills for, and um, here I'm not just speaking about things like, um, I don't know, uh, language or ethnicity or place of origin, but more like um, everything else, you know, it might be socioeconomic status and uh, it might be uh, disability, ability, people being neurodivergent, neurotypical and all the range you know different genders different sexual orientations so it's like almost um, yeah can we as a team can we as an IIT have enough resources and between us hold enough awareness and do enough communication with participants so there can be enough inclusion there might not be the most wonderful meal you've ever eaten although hope it will be <laughs> but we do our best that's my dream uh, as i experienced it until now that's also what you guard <laughs> yeah. you take care of that part oh thank you where, where i might be a little bit blind sometimes you point out hey can we do it this way can we do it that way have we included everyone so i'm, oh. I'm full of trust that that will happen at this iit this, this inclusion and this making this meal is wonderful for everyone and one more aspect you bring mm -hmm. in that I didn't mention already is that mm -hmm. you also have a focus on working with trauma. Yeah. And that's also kind of include everyone who is having carrying a big pain. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. is also important for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I learned my nonviolent communication and trained as a trainer mostly in the UK and some of it was in the US and in Europe, and then I started working uh, in the territories that used to be like Russian Empire and then Soviet Union. And of course, there's different independent states. And um, uh, yeah, and I was working in Russia and uh, I was really surprised, you know, that uh, sometimes things didn't work and situations would arise that I've never ever seen in any English speaking training, like when I was teaching, you know, like in Russian language across different countries where people speak Russian, uh, like this high level conflict arising like that out of nowhere. 
and people get in like very, very intense feelings uh, that we'd express in very kind of upsetting ways of other people and very kind of like impactful ways. Yeah. So that's how I started looking at like, wow, what can I do for the group? What can I do for myself? And that's yeah. kind of got me on to um, various modalities that work with trauma. And for example, uh, Marshall did a lot of this work uh, in populations that were in countries that were affected by trauma and um, uh, different um, ways of suffering and disaster, you know, and uh, I track that kind of trauma work to his work on reconciliation, forgiveness, what we now call depth work, you know. Um, for example, there's that famous story and the bit in the book where he's listening to this woman who experienced yeah. horrible gender violence, you know, and she's screaming and uh, she's having very intense feelings and he's been able to be with her and accompany her through it you know so for me like um this is uh what i relate to and other modalities you know like i found a uh, very he helpful robert gonzalez work to start with and i know that mironel who've been the trainer you know like he's very experienced in that mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, sarah payton's work that combines and we see in neurobiology Another shift i was very used to working on verbal modalities so it's like we can talk about it we can do our healing and our support around trauma with words and then I ended up uh, in Vietnam and in a way like uh, in my experience, the best how I understand, I'm happy to be corrected, you know, <laughs> so if, like if any Vietnamese people watch this video and have a different understanding, I'm sure they can leave comments under the video or something. Uh, but um, what I noticed, like people couldn't speak about the same things uh, and I talked to colleagues in different modalities, for example, people who do systemic constellations in Vietnam. And they had the same observations. I was like, wow, how can I like support people and contribute to people? Like I work in words and first my Vietnamese is not enough to work in. So I can work in English, but still like, even when both people have English or Russian, like it's not enough. So what do I do? And then somehow people started inviting me um, in Vietnam to do things uh, with art. I was like, oh, wow, like, I'm not an artist, you know, <laughs> I finished like art school when I was a kid, but uh, I don't think of myself as an artist, I like draw and paint and you can see, you know, behind me, <laughs> uh, it's something that I painted um, in summer. But like, yeah, I'm not that kind of like artist who has gallery showings or stuff like that, you know, <laughs> so um, yeah, but I was like, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> And so that's how, you know, like I ended up um, getting art therapy degree yeah. that in very authoritarian countries with authoritarian governments that do a lot of surveillance, people are just conditions conditioned from the childhood, like be mindful of what you say to strangers. Mm. And of course, like if your pain and your suffering and your trauma happened within your family, you can't speak to them. But you can't speak to anyone else. And then like, mm -hmm. it's not a wonderful way to live. You know, you kind of carry all the trauma and it eats you from the inside. Uh, and in a way also it meets a need of protecting yourself from any consequences from the government and protecting your family. So like, um, I found that very useful as well. And for me, coming from a very verbal culture, <laughs> it works that it, it brings me into the subconscious. Oh yeah, of course. So yeah. that's that's also the present that I get from working with painting or creative work. Yes, that's the integration, yeah. isn't it? You walk yeah. from your subconscious into your verbal conscious and yeah. then back again. And it's almost like um, embroidering it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Olga, you have such a beautiful package. And <laughs> I really look forward to meet you alive and work with you in the in international intensive training and look forward to what you have to add, what you can bring us. Oh, me too, Hester, me too. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me and interviewing yeah. me and thank you for all the kind words. Mm -hmm.